We're in the Mixed Reality Lab of the University of Nottingham's Computer Science School. And uh, this is actually the lab space where quite a few things happen. So it's in a state of perpetual mess and chaos. Uh, but this is the little uh, piece of sandy we've carved out. We grabbed the space to set up a virtual reality bay, running off a of Vive, which is usually we use the Vive system for any sort of virtual reality development. Both because the tech is pretty good, the hardware is pretty good, but also it's the most open system for development, as say opposed to the Oculus and stuff like that. And it does allow you, I will grab us a prop, to use stuff like the uh, Vive Tracker, which allow you to bring in other um, uh, objects, accessories, and more interesting virtual reality interactions than you would in a closed ecosystem, which is why we tend to use it more uh, than Oculus or other technologies. Last time we saw you on Computer File, we were looking at Scanning of miniatures? 3D scanning miniatures for various uses and augmented reality storytelling. So we moved on, uh, we're trying to close the loop a little bit, you know, take something physical, scan it into a digital asset that you can use in virtual worlds and stuff like that. So you may recall in that video, we scanned a bunch of miniatures that people brought in. We put those in a virtual museum so people could walk around them like Godzilla size. So, okay, we've gone from the physical to the digital, why not go back to the physical again? So what we did is we started uh, 3D printing those miniatures, you might recall this. Guy, I think he was the most popular one on the website, back into physical form at slightly different scales. And then we thought, okay, how do we push that envelope a little bit? And what can we do with these things? Because in fact, it's still just a hunk of plastic, depending on your printing technology, but usually it'll be just that. So we thought we'd go use a bit of tech to now start overlaying those photorealistic 3D scans, you may recall from the previous video, back onto these uh, physical objects. It's a little bit tricky because you have to know where this physical object is in space, and there's various ways to do that. But once you've got that, and somehow you can skin this hunk of plastic with that photorealistic scan, you can have some very interesting interactions. The key point there is locating it. How do you yes. know where it is? Well, the various technologies all they new to do this. So basically, it comes back to uh, locating objects in space, which is not quite a solved problem. I mean, we wish we had indoor GPS, but we're not quite there. Uh, so you can do things like um, tracking with ultra-wide band. It's used widely in robotics. You can do stuff with time of flight. I mean, anybody who's used uh, recent VR, the controllers, the headsets, are tracked somehow. For example, this is a, a Vive tracker, which is effectively the controller without the controller bit. And these allow you to track something in space just by attaching them to something and then just locating them. So this now effectively can be brought into VR. You can use uh, newer optical tracking technologies, but those when they work, they're fantastic, but getting them to work can be a bit tricky when you don't know what your final object will be or when that object is sort of malleable. So for now, we have been using these in our VR experiences because they tie in with the rest of the ecosystem. So one reason to do this would be to haptically experience objects in different scales. For example, here we have that miniature. The original thing was, uh, what, 28 millimeter scale, about an inch tall. Now we have something bigger, and we can take that in VR and uh, interact with it at a larger scale. Now, okay, that's not a big step, but if we take something different, like, for example, the Veil Vestal Virgin from Chatsworth House. The actual statue is about two meters tall, I believe, and here she is in comfortable palm size. More and more museums, for example, which is one of the contexts we work with a lot, uh, what they do is they have now, they are now 3D scanning the collections. So they have vast archives of 3D models of things. So you can interact with those online, on screen, in VR, the usual thing, walk around it, but again, you can't touch it, you can't actually really interact with it. Things that would be at a different scale, like the Veil Vestal is much too large, the real thing to do something like this, or objects that are really one of a kind you would be able to touch, like say the Crown Jewels, for example, you'd be able to interact with them in ways you'd never be allowed to, for example, like, say putting on the Crown Jewels, or see entire environments that and buildings that don't exist. There are limitations to technology. VR is, has a few unsolved problems. So seeing as we were using these uh, trackers, these do have some issues. So of course they need line of sight, just like the controllers. They are a considerable physical object that you have to work around. You, can't, you could just attach it to any object, but then not all uh, objects uh, have this handy sort of way you can attach them. And even if you do, what happens the first time you do that? Somebody sees that, hand it to them, what do they do? They grab the tracker because they think it's a handy handhold. But of course, what that means is you break line of sight and the tracking fails. 
So you need somehow to work around that. Our sort of solution, and you'll see here some of the objects we ended up using from our museum partners, because this was the um, probably the best place to launch this technology, is taking, putting the trackers inside boxes. The tracking works right through them. But here are some very practical benefits. Nobody, well, nobody with normal size hands at least, can possibly grab these trackers and fully occlude them from the Vive lighthouses. One uh, elephant of the room that I haven't really mentioned is the 3D printing of these objects. Now, some might say that is a solved problem, 3D printing being a well traversed technology at the moment, but eh, it's not always the case. For starters, you are trying to 3D print 3D scanned models. 3D scanned models Whatever technique you might use, might it be photogrammetry like we use for the, three, for the miniatures or something like a laser scanner which was used to scan this engine for example. Uh, they never produced optimized models, optimized models as the kind you would make from the ground up for say use in uh, games or animations, stuff like that. Those models always need some cleanup. They have millions of vertices more than they would need to be optimized. And often the models are not um, ready to use, they still have gaps in them, they still have errors, stuff that really doesn't uh, help out with uh, any 3D printing technique. So you have a few ways to go about that, either you fix the model or you try and use techniques that ignore them. In this case, for example, which was a sort of easy object to fix, this was printable on a standard FDM printer. An additive process, layer by layer, and everything works fine, this is just by depositing material. And this is the kind of commercial 3D printing technology that uh, you can have in the home right now, so most organizations do have access to it. But something so complicated as the Eagleero engine, where you have a lot of very small parts that are not necessarily very well supported, the problem with an FDM printer is that you do need to support the overhangs and the uh, objects that uh, are not connected during the printing and then remove those supports. Quite the job. This one actually was printed by our partners in the advanced manufacturing building with one of the let me see if I get this right, a uh, sintering printer, I believe. And those are very nice in the sense that they use a laser to sinter powder, plastic powder, inside basically a bin of powder. The entire object, while it's being made, is suspended in that powder. And you come out with this fantastically detailed and way stronger than it looks 3D model. All these fine bits are actually exactly as they came out of the model. They may look like errors, but they're not errors in the 3D printing process. Rather, they are errors in the laser 3D scanning process that we used. Sadly, this is not quite ready for domestic use, but maybe we'll get there. Even with these technologies, they're not, there are objects that are not suitable for 3D printing. So there is a halfway house that you can use, and that was an empty acrylic box. When you have something that you can't 3D print, but you still want people to be able to interact with it in VR in some way, well, what we did was basically place a tracker inside this box. So we have a trackable box. And in VR, we can show a glass box or something similar, the exact same dimensions. But inside this, in VR, we can place any 3D model we want, whatever. It's something we can't print, we can change it dynamically, whatever we want. You can get the halfway house where people can pick this box up in the real world, picking it up in VR, bringing it up to the face, rotating it to get any angle they want, even the bottom, because the bottom can be see-through in VR, and get that much closer to an object they would not normally be able to experience. It might be, as we are saying, something very large, now again in the palm of the hand, almost. So it is a bit of a compromise, but an interesting one at that. What environment are you putting in? How does it all work? For our purposes and uh, to sort of begin off with a museum context, since we've got objects from uh, the collection of the Derby Museum and Art Gallery, uh, we've placed them in sort of the setting of um, the warehouse of a museum, because after all, this is giving you access to stuff that you normally would not even perhaps be able to see at a museum. Any museum can at most have uh, usually less than half of its collection on display at any time. So we used the Unity game engine, which is, together with Unreal, probably the most popular game engine, or rather, at this point, experience engine, to make virtual reality experiences. A pretty straightforward environment, get, help give us everything we needed to uh, pull together the various disparate parts of this. It's effectively really a, a standard virtual reality setup. The biggest problem you might have for hardware specifications is having enough USB ports, uh, because each one of these trackers requires its own USB dongle which means you really quickly run out of them and you don't even realize it. Where it is in comparison to the other one. So we'll ideally get something like that. As you can see, 
our three different heights around the model, then that will create a sparse point cloud. So basically, the, between the images, it will figure out interesting points on the model, so features, and put those as points in space.